Oh, yay, the baby's with us. Hi. <laughs> and the mother. No, sorry, not trying to. <laughs> Thanks for joining. So, yeah, this is um, our Wednesday Well of Being. <clears throat> and we are making our way through this epic tome. It doesn't actually look like we've made it that far, but we've been on this for like eight months. And we've been a little bit tripped up by these only two pages, which is, you know, one of the most um, kind of essential teachings of the Buddha, the Satipatthana Sutta. And I know Ryan Redman was here with you all last week. Yeah. How was that? Awesome. Ryan's so cool. Um, so we've been really taking our time and considering kind of mindfulness and its application to the mind. And tonight we're going to move on and actually look a little bit about applying our mindfulness to the five hindrances. Woohoo! <laughs> so the hindrances are, um, many of you I'm sure familiar with them. It's such a area of classic teaching. And I want to say that tonight I felt so fortunate that there's just so much incredible writing about these practices. And two of the teachers I felt I learned a lot from are Gil Fronsdale, some folks might know him. He's down in Redwood City and just such a beautiful writer. Um, and also Philip Moffat, also a local teacher here. Um, so the five hindrances, I'll bring them up and we'll kind of explore them a bit in our meditation. And then we'll have more of an engaged discussion about these hindrances because um, I think it's a... Yeah, it's really interesting that these can be applied not only to our meditation practice, but to our everyday life and what we're doing um, throughout. So the five hindrances start with desire, sensual desire, right? The things we want, our food, our um, relationships, our um, all those kind of experiences of sensual desire that we have in our life. And yeah, I think there's in meditation, often the desire comes up where we have like this moment that actually feels good in our practice. And we just want to keep that moment. And then ill will. So this one sounds kind of, I don't know, there's something about it that sounds a little archaic to me, ill will. But it is, you know, the mind that's caught up in resentment, anger, frustration. That definitely comes up in practice, right? And also <clears throat> with sensual desire in practice, it can come up more like a fantasy, like, oh, I just can't wait till this meditation's over and I can go get a taco. Mm -hmm. It's going to be really fantastic, right? So this, this sense of what's pulling us, the sense of what's pushing us and the aversion. Then we have good old sloth and torpor, you know? <laughs> yeah, classics. Um, and I always, I hope I get this right. Cause I always confuse them. One is really for mind and the other is for body. Um, so sloth is really when the mind gets kind of, am I right cage? I think so too. And then torpor. <clears throat> so yeah, it's like the, the mind when the mind gets really dull and fuzzy, you know, and you're doing like that kind of meditation <laughs> practice. And then there's also, um, you know, the feeling of just the body being really heavy. Um, there's number four is restlessness and worry. I feel like they really, they got like such a good exhaustive list here. So restlessness and worry, and that's often associated kind of with like wind in a lot of Eastern traditions, this kind of high upward energy towards the mind and towards thinking. <clears throat> so with restlessness and worry, there's a state of mental agitation. So it's not just the like leaning towards something or wanting away from something or the kind of dullness. It's like this preoccupation. And for me, I find in my practice, there's this real like obsessive quality of it where I think that my focusing and analyzing this area of restlessness and worry is like really productive, right? We get really caught in it. And then the last, and happy to say we're going to focus on this one tonight. I'll just say Gil Fronsdale teaches this as a six-month course, <laughs> which is incredible. We're going to do like a very high overview. Um, but what I really wanted to focus on tonight, just because I find it so fascinating and complicated and interesting, is, is doubt. Anybody else with me? 
yeah doubt is like special kind of challenge and feeling <clears throat> in in our practice it's funny because it comes up a lot in a not very subtle way which is i'm bad at this i'm doing this wrong like maybe i shouldn't even be practicing like why do i even why do i even do this anybody ever had that and i think it's really nice to kind of shine the light directly on that like yeah that's a part of what's in the way of our practice. And, and that's a part of something we need to kind of meet courageously in our practice. So central desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry, skeptical doubt. It's gonna be a good night. <laughs> it's gonna be some um, interesting uh, material to cover. And just to kind of refresh us in, in why we're looking, especially at these aspects, is that we've been going over these, these beautiful applications, um, the four foundations of mindfulness, the Satipatthana Sutta. And it's truly just like a almost one and a half page, not even two page description. And here we are, the Buddha is now in his mid fifties, right? He's been awakened for well over a decade. He has thousands of students all across India and he continues as he is deepening his own practice and understanding and as he's developing as a teacher to put these teachings in new ways. And so the Satipatthana Sutta, it's, it's like, um, I'm not going to say like it's his best album, but it has that feeling, right? Like he just is getting it all together and he's just sharing it in such this clear way. <clears throat> and so I want to read this simple way that uh, Thich Nhat Hanh um, kind of just pulls the very threads of it together. And, and we've practiced a variety of parts of the Satipatthana Sutta together, and we will tonight. Um, so he says, um, first the practitioner observes their body, their breath, the bodily postures of walking, standing, lying, and sitting. Bodily actions, such as going forward and backward, looking, putting on robes, eating, drinking, using the toilet, speaking, washing robes, the part of the body, such as hair and teeth and sinews and bones, internal organs, marrow, intestines, saliva and sweat, the elements which compose the body, such as water, air and heat, and the stages of the body's decay, from the time it dies to when bones turn to dust. <laughs> While observing the body, the practitioner is aware of all the details concerning it. While breathing in, the practitioner knows they are breathing in. While breathing out, the practitioner knows they are breathing out. Breathing in and making their whole body calm and at peace, the practitioner knows they are breathing in and making their whole body at peace. Walking, the practitioner knows they are walking. Sitting, the practitioner knows they are sitting and performing other movements. The practitioner knows that they are doing those movements. The contemplation of the body is not realized only during the moments of sitting, but throughout the entire day, including the moments one is begging and eating and washing. In the contemplation of feelings, the practitioner contemplates feelings as they arise, develop, and fade, feelings which are pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And so just a, a little paraphrase, we covered in a couple weeks ago now, just that preliminary contemplation of just the body, this form body, and that applying our mindfulness to the body helps us develop this stability, this tranquility. And when we are applying mindfulness, we are both having that cultivation of a stable mind and an opportunity to develop insight. And so as we observe the form body, we start to recognize that the body is comprised of all these different parts, and even to the point of contemplating the body as it is decaying, and contemplating the body as it is impermanent. <clears throat> and then the contemplation of the breath is it's almost like a refining. So with our attention on the body, it's um, sometimes described as giving, you know, the wild stallion a, a lot of room to explore. So you start out with this wide area for the wild stallion of the mind. And then you like bring it in a little to a smaller space. And that's like bringing it in just to the breath, following the breath. So the attention slowly develops from this wide, this more refined and focused. <clears throat> and 
as we will do together tonight, we'll go through the body, go through the breath, bringing our attention inward. And then the contemplation of feelings, right? Recognizing that throughout our body and our mind, we have these sensations and feelings that feel pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. And it's really amazing to not only give ourselves that uh, opportunity to pay attention and noticing like in this moment, is that thing that feels like an itch truly unpleasant? Is it, what does it feel like when I actually scratch the itch? What is pleasantness like? And then recognizing so many areas of the body that are also neutral. So that's part of our feelings. Um, and then this big piece, which we've been on now for many weeks, uh, in the contemplation of mind, the practitioner contemplates the presence of mental states, craving, they know they're craving or not craving, angry or drowsy, knowing you are not angry or drowsy, centered or distracted, knowing you are not centered or distracted, and whether the practitioner is open-minded, closed-minded, blocked, concentrated, or enlightened, the practitioner knows at once. And if the practitioner is not experiencing any of those states, the practitioner knows at once. The practitioner <clears throat> recognizes and is aware of every mental state which arises within them in the present moment. And we talked about this a couple of weeks back, but still so much of what is going on in our mind, we are not aware of. Like, are we actually aware when we're feeling irritated or kind of like maybe the hangry style of irritated? Are we aware when we are already kind of making our way towards a feeling of like intense craving? Very often it's kind of in the background and we're either suppressing it or distracting ourselves otherwise. And just this cultivation where we can be aware of what we are feeling and know it and be aware of what we are not feeling and know it that beautiful subtlety of starting to just observe thoughts and feelings and have that meta um, awareness or attention. Come on in. Welcome. <clears throat> and then this last paragraph here in the contemplation of the objects of the mind, the practitioner contemplates the five hindrances to liberation, desire, ill will, drowsiness, agitation, and doubt. Whenever they are present, the five skandhas, which comprise a person, their body, their feeling, perceptions, and mental formations, the six sense organs, the six sense objects, the seven factors of awakening, and the four noble truths. These are all objects of the mind, and they contain all dharmas. So just tonight, we're going to do the skandhas. I'm sorry, we're going to do the uh, hindrances. And then I think next week, um, we haven't done this in this group for a while of focusing on the seven factors of awakening or the paramitas, just so beautiful. So it's like tonight we're focusing on here's what's in the way. And next week it's here's what we cultivate to get closer to these states we're seeking. So that's, that's a little from the Buddha himself. And um, yeah, I think... I think it makes sense for us to go into a practice and we'll explore a little bit of these hindrances and moreover, just give ourselves this precious opportunity to, to drop in and stabilize our attention. And so beginning by having a sense of our body in this room, <clears throat> noticing the 
experience of the room or for folks online, the experience of your room at home. Noticing the sounds, the quality of the light if your eyes are closed. Even connecting to this day and this season, feeling a sense of what the sky is doing outside of this room, where the sun is in the sky. <clears throat> and to help us invite our attention and awareness into the body, we begin by softening through the muscles in the face. Softening any tension in the forehead and between the brows. And softening through the eyes and the cheekbones. And continuing that sense of softening into the jaw and the chest and the belly. And even though your attention might be carried away momentarily here and there, just keep returning, and deepening this delving into the body. And so breathing in, aware of the body, breathing in and breathing out, simply aware of the body, breathing out. Becoming curious about the sensations throughout the body. This body is not just one feeling or sensation. It is just a magnificent combination of different areas of sensation. Feeling the aliveness of the body through all these sensations. And even while we notice the movement and undulation of sensations in the body, we invite this quality of stillness to the body. This quality of stillness is the outer and inner posture. The outer posture, we are simply not going anywhere else and not doing anything. And the inner posture of stillness is inviting all the activity of mind, Everything we need to do still today, we just invite it to be still. If not released, at least no longer in the center, maybe out in the periphery of our attention and awareness.
Just a couple moments longer with this first application of mindfulness to the body. Breathing in and knowing we are breathing in through the body. And breathing out, feeling and sensing from within the body that we are breathing out. in applying our mindfulness to the body and to the breath. There is no need for words or narration. No words to explain or analyze. It's experiential. Allowing our attention and awareness to ride the experience of the breath as though it were a rider upon a horse. And so shifting and narrowing our focus a bit to applying our mindfulness to breathing. Breathing in, dwelling in this present moment of breath. And breathing out, knowing that this is a wonderful moment. Every time the mind gets caught up in a memory or image or thought, we just simply relax and release whatever has captured our attention and return to the breath in this moment with a sense of rejoicing. Every time we are coming back, we're cultivating more deeply our attention. And so continuing with the breath, Breathing in, dwelling in the present moment, breathing out, knowing this is a wonderful moment. And it is a wonderful moment because we are fully inhabiting it with our breath, our awareness and attention.
Now that we've settled in a bit to the body, the mind, take a moment to connect to our intention. This is an opportunity to feel aligned with our innermost values, what we are here for, what we're here for tonight, what we think we actually may be here for in this lifetime. And consider a word or phrase that really ignites the heart with this sense of motivation. And then collectively connecting to the motivation of bodhicitta, the awakened heart, recognizing that everything and anything we can do for ourselves will be of most benefit when we share it with others. That our practice here of becoming more sane, more connected, more open is in service for all beings. And feeling the goodness of that, the integrity of that. And allowing these aspirations and intentions to gently fall into the background. And for a moment, giving ourselves just that full return to the breath and the body. And then shifting our mind and attention to a bit of imagination as we explore these hindrances. Part of our exploration is to recognize what it is like when the hindrance arises. What is the felt experience of the hindrance in the body and the mind and the energy? What is the feeling when it starts to dissipate or, or leave? our mind state, our body. So we can take a moment and consider something that we feel that kind of desire for. Thing we find ourselves really looking towards, wanting, needing. This could be a person. This could be some sort of desired food or drink. This could be simply finding space and time for rest and ease. Let's see if you can fan the flame of desire so that you can feel desire arise in the mind and the heart and the body. Sometimes it has a quality of acute longing. Just noticing what it feels like in the body and in the mind. It might brighten our thoughts momentarily, making us more focused. And then gently shifting our attention awareness back to the breath and seeing if we can observe the desire dissipate. 
watching it disappear like the wake of a boat. Checking in, seeing if there is now an absence of the desire. Maybe there is a presence of a calm mind or simply attention and awareness on the breath and the body. And if the desire is still lingering, if there's some residue, no problem, just noticing that. And if we could think of our desire as a phrase, I want this, we can think of our ill will as I don't want that. And so shifting our attention now to bringing to mind something that we have some aversion towards. Something we don't want, we don't like, we'd rather not be there. Part of ourself, someone else some other situation or experience. Again, just enough so we get that felt hit of ill will in the body, in the mind, and the heart. Noticing how it may shift and change our experience. Quality of the mind, maybe contraction. Qualities in the body, different areas of sensation. And then bringing forth our breath and body to the main stage. Seeing if we can release this aversion through refocusing on the breath and the body. And then maybe we already are aware, especially of the time of the day, that there is some sloth and torpor that's here. And just notice the quality of mind and body that feels tired, feels heavy. Maybe releasing the focus on breath and body and allowing the mind to feel a bit more of that laziness or drowsiness and be very curious what does this feel like how does it come how does it arrive into our experience
And then with the next inhale, imagine drawing in a sense of vividness and clarity and presence. And with the exhale, gently releasing, reinvigorating our connection to breath and body and shaking off that torpor, that feeling of drowsiness and sloth. And again, noticing how does this shift and change? A momentary experience of body, mind, heart. Maybe with these refreshed and renewed breaths, we have a whole other sense of our mental clarity. Maybe we can connect even deeper to calmness, presence. then shifting to this fourth hindrance, agitation, worry. For many of us, just saying those words already brings forth an embodied experience. And for others of us, it could be helpful to think about a situation that we feel unsettled, uncertain, something that's like gnawing at us in a way. Again, noticing, how does it arise? Where does that experience come from? Where does it inhabit in the body? And then again, just decentering that experience, bringing forth the breath, the body, and observing and watching as this experience of agitation can gently release and dissipate. Or for those of us in the center, more agitation with the noise outside, noticing that. And once again, really fully coming into the breath and the body. And then allowing ourselves to open to that feeling of doubt. Am I doing this right? When will this change or get better? What should I be doing? <clears throat> this could be in the context of our practice in this moment. Could be another area of our life. Noticing the particular signature of doubt, how that feels in the body and how it shifts the quality of mind, and the heart.
Once again, reconnecting to breath and seeing if you can add a level of kindness to the breath. As though when you were breathing in, you were breathing in a sense of care and kindness to the body. When you're breathing out, breathing out and extending a sense of kindness and care to the body, the heart and the mind. Maybe as we're simply following breath and bringing kindness, one of the hindrances naturally arises. Noticing it's arising, returning to the breath. And for a couple more moments, just continuing here, the sense of kindness towards ourself, towards our practice, Breath by breath. Before we bring our practice to a close, taking a moment and noticing the quality of the body and the heart and the mind. Thank you for your practice. Brave journeyers into the hindrances. So before we get started, I wanted to mention that the San Francisco Dharma Collective, kind of a unique space. It's a volunteer run center. And it's a place in which we come together for the Dharma truly as community uh, with one another. And while the meditation is such a wonderful way for us to train uh, our mind and our heart. It's really the discussion and the reflection that allows us to deepen and grow. And in order for that to be possible, we apply some specific principles to our conversations with one another. We really invite in the qualities of compassionate listening, right? And that compassionate listening is Really hearing what um, folks have to say from a place of deep aspiration and care, 
that others would be free from suffering. And then we also bring in the compassionate speaking, right? Ourselves coming from a place of care and kindness as we are um, offering what we can offer to others. It sounds so simple. It's really incredibly challenging to get ahead of our judgment, get ahead of our contraction, right? We just are like, oh, I don't want to hear that. And like, what are they saying? Or I would say it this way. So it's a really interesting part of our practice is how we listen and how we speak here in a contemplative space together. So that's an invitation. And our aspiration in this center, we have many people who come all the time for many years. We love you so much. And we have many people who maybe it's your first time. We love you so much. So in order to make that happen, we kind of have to have the set of kind of connective agreements and, um, and care for one another. So does that make sense to everybody here? Great. So I would love to start by, so if folks in this room want to speak, the request is we bring the mic to you in some way or another. And if folks want to speak online, um, Diane, you can let me know. Thank you so much. Or Jason, I'm not sure who's there. Okay. Thank you, Diane. So yeah, anyone have any reflections or questions on that practice? What did you notice? Did any hindrances come out to play? Were they being shy? <laughs> Yeah, would love to hear from folks. Any thoughts or reflections? Come on down. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. That was really um, good for me right now. I feel like it really brought a lot up. Um, and I don't really know if I have a question, I guess. I just really, I felt like the desire was so strong. Like even mm. when you said to let go of it, I was just like, Oh my God, it's here all the time. Mm. I don't even know how to let it go. Um, and then the worry and agitation, I think was also really strong. Yeah. Um, and then the doubt. <laughs> <laughs> and then probably the saw. <laughs> There's more subtle. So yeah. all of them. And did you notice really, like a yeah. like a distinguishable difference between those qualities in the body and in the mind? Or they have the same quality? There were slightly different. I mean, there was a strong urge to be like, gosh, I wish this was easier to track and yeah. feel. And um, but the agitation and worry seemed to come up really fast and like you know, right. really hit my belly or something yes. and like wiggle its way up. Yeah. Um, and the, the sloth and was really just sort of like in my legs and mm. just like a heaviness of sitting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think the doubt was probably the one I couldn't feel in my body the most, mm. but I am so comfortable with it in my mind. I think <laughs> just like, why am I here? Why, why am I doing this? Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I, yeah, that one was kind of hard to, to place in yeah. the body. And did, um, you know, those periods in between of breathing was there? Yeah. 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 And that seemed to let it go a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So that was really nice. And, and then the time you said something about this being a wonderful moment, I was mm -hmm. like, oh yes, it, it, you know, it was yeah. just a really nice reminder yeah. uh, for me, uh, you know, personally just right now. Yeah. Yeah just sort of rushing around today and right you know just like oh yeah this is I'm okay and this is really nice to be here and yeah I'm okay so yeah yeah thank, thank you. you so much yeah yeah anyone else what did you notice or questions yes there's someone there wonderful Thanks. <laughs> um when we were kind of like bringing up each of the different hindrances, like after I've, you know, like the first like three, I was like, oh, this is like really easy to bring these up. Like these one are very familiar. Right. Um, yeah. But also using like imagery or mm -hmm. directing the attention in a certain way. And so yeah. I had the observation of like, oh, right. Like these are conditioned experiences that happen in our minds. Like when they happen naturally, it's so easy to get stuck in them and like be so associated with it. But it's like, oh yeah, I can just like make that happen. <laughs> like, wow. So it was interesting to watch that um, mm. and to also be able to like watch it go away and some were easier and some were harder. Yeah. Um, but it was 
helpful to have that happen experientially Mm because you know sometimes you know that cognitively and then to actually like feel into the experience is great so that is so beautifully stated and yeah I just think it's that is such a um like that is the kind of insight we we hope for we don't always get it but like oh my god like that's just something I thought and now it feels real but it's not real I just thought it and then also that familiar I'd be curious if you wouldn't mind saying a couple words more like what was it like to feel like the familiarity of some of those? Um, I think because of this exercise of like intentionally creating that in the mind, um, it was easier to have that separation of it. Mm. And also to notice some of the nuances, more so the like physical sensations in the body mm. and how that came up. Yeah. Um, so that's some of what I'm kind of like thinking about as you asked that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I noticed a, a lot of familiarity too. It's like, oh yeah, these are like always here. And I don't know if anyone else noticed this, but I felt like, you know, directing my attention towards them more deliberately and then focusing on the breath. The breath was like amazing. <laughs> like it was such a like, oh yeah, this is so good. It was interesting. It like helped my breath practice. Um, So, yeah, thank you so much. Any other? Yes. Hey, um, I thought it was interesting that the, I feel constantly hindered by those hindrances. (laughs) Um, in general, and yeah. particularly during meditation. Yes. But this time I was like, oh, it's cool because I'm meant to be. <laughs> That's so it was like weirdly empowering. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm I'm distracted. That's my sloth. Yep. Distracting me or something. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. No, but it was cool to like bucket the experiences more. Right. Yeah. This is being like, oh, this all sucks because I'm being hindered right now. Yeah. It's like, yeah. that's what we're exploring. So. Yes. Yeah. And I do think, you know, it is something to bring into other practices too. And that naming and that labeling is so powerful to just have that, um, you know, that feeling of like, I can see this as it, it's almost like you put the pin in the balloon. It's like, oh, you know, like I see you, right. You're there. And so interesting. Um, you know, one of my favorite, 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 favorite stories about doubt of all time is we, we covered it here 35 chapters ago, the, the night of the Buddha's awakening, right? And this is a night where, you know, for many nights, I mean, for many years, seven years, right, of the Buddha exploring these different spiritual paths with one teacher, you know, doing all sorts of practices of concentration and being like, yeah, but still at the end of the day, I've concentrated a lot and yet I haven't shifted how I react to the world. And then going to a whole other set of practices where he does self-mortification. I'm not going to eat almost anything. I'm going to, you know, really deny the body and that will be my way in and not finding it there. So you could imagine he's got some doubt going on, right? He's tried many things, seven years, left the kingdom, his baby son, his wife, you know, so he is trying this new method of practice this middle way of practice and there's such a deep sense for him that he knows he's getting close to awakening and he's sitting under the tree and you know really having this sense of being held by the stars above and by the grass below and yet right before he reaches an awakening just this total clear seeing and understanding of reality as it is doubt comes to visit him um, in the form of Mara. So Mara is kind of always considered this uh, difficult aspect, of course, of ourself. In, in this story, it's this externalized demon, right? But it's, it's us. And Mara comes and really tries to incite the doubt in the Buddha to prevent him from awakening. And he says, why do you deserve to wake up? Who? who can vouch for you that you actually deserve to wake up? Um, So really this idea of like, you don't deserve to be here. You're doing it wrong. Like this is not right. And, um, you know, according, especially to, to this um, text, but many others that the Buddha has already been alive for so many hundreds of thousands of lifetimes and been developing and accumulating merit. And that 
on this time, he has been witnessed by the earth, right? And so he puts his hands on the ground and says, the earth witnesses me. And that completely obliterates not only his doubt, but obliterates Mara altogether. So I think it's this interesting idea of like in our meditation, like what is our ground? Like what is it that we can touch and be like, I I don't know, I don't, the word deserve is weird, but like I belong here. I belong in this practice. This practice belongs in me. And that can be very elusive for us. Like, how do we have that sense of spiritual confidence, right? Like, this is what I'm meant to be doing and why I'm here. And it's so funny that, you know, we have enough of it that we're all in this room. And yet we can have a whole practice full of doubt, like, oh, I'm doing it wrong, doing it wrong, doing it wrong. So it's um, it's such a tricky, a tricky one, which is why I wanted us to spend a little more time with it tonight. Any other reflections or questions? Any folks online? Hi, Claudia. Nice to see you. Hi, everybody. Hi, Walt. Hi, Jason. Yes, I see a hand back there. Cage and then Claudia. Yeah, then Claudia. So please. So I wanted to reflect on what you just said because uh, when I meditate, I have a very vivid vision of a mountain. Mm, uh, and that mountain is the ground that vouches for me, essentially. It's also my my uh, representation of stillness. Yeah. And so I was picturing myself sitting in front of this sort of inert, expectationless mountain. Mm. And it's completely silent and we don't talk at each other, but we communicate telepathically. Uh, and all it does is just reinforce the one word that is my purpose. Mm. And so throughout the practice, I was thinking as I was communicating with it and hindrances would come up, uh, my thoughts would go faster and my breath would race mm. and it would just say, it would re restate that one word mm. and it would instantly reset my breath. Mm. So it was the mountain continuously validating that I'm trying to bring up hindrances and it's simply silent expectation saying, do your purpose. Yeah. So beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. You. And, and, you know, I love the image of the mountain, right. And it is such a nice one for practice, like the stable base, like we are a mountain, right. When we're in a sitting posture and that stable base, and it is so helpful. The natural world is such a great teacher to us, you know, like all these trees, even the ones that don't look that big, they are like a lot older than us, right? <laughs> um, you know, maybe they're only a hundred years old, but still like, and this ability to kind of have that, um, that kind of uprightness against the wind and being buffeted, you often hear as another metaphor. It's really powerful to have that image. So I appreciate you offering that for folks here to consider, like, is there an image that can help, right? And I, I really do like the touching ground idea. And um, I get to practice a lot outside or I choose to practice a lot outside. And I feel there is a stability in that um, and that sense of connection that can help. But it can be really elusive to find that true confidence, Um especially when our mind feels really busy um, and really challenged. So, yeah, it's interesting. I don't want to get too down on doubt because I have to believe there's probably a good reason it's here with us and it can support us, but it can be a, a real difficult one for practice. Um, can last quite a while. Thank you. Claudia. Steve, um, um... I, I have other things to share, but I wanted to ask you, when it comes to doubt, I mean, does it refer exclusively to self-doubt or is there any other, are there any other examples of? I'd say probably a lot of it is self-doubt, but also doubt in the teachings, you know, and doubt in the teacher, and doubt in the whole, like, the whole, I think it's a big one. Um, and it happens a lot for, it's interesting. It happens a lot for people on retreat. You're like, Oh, really? Oh man, you made your, <laughs> you're committed. And, but it, it's, it is, it's a really interesting flavor. I, I don't know if folks here have experienced doubt on retreat, but it's usually like, it's like right around the corner from loneliness and agitation, you know, and you're like, oh, fuck, 
this? <laughs> Why am I even here? And who are these people? And like, you know, you get this doubt that like, it's not the right thing. Um, oh, what a conflict. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I can, I can see how doubt like that would be good sometimes or healthy in the sense yeah. of like questioning or not being dogmatic. But on the other hand, feeling that agitation and the opposite would be yeah. so conflictive. Yeah. yeah. No, I yeah. just wanted to share that um I um when you when you asked us to feel ill will and you uh described, you know, that it's usually the anger and resentment or whatever, I did feel this shrinking, this tightness, you yeah. know, in my in my stomach. And of course it's a familiar feeling. And uh and then when you said something about like you might want to take a breath or something. I mean, it was like a gasp. It was like, oh, you know, I felt so liberating. It was, it was yeah. great. It felt really mm. good. And then I also felt um, sloth and terper. And um, I mean, it's a combination of things. I did a lot of exercise today and I, it's hot here in Mexico. And, but, um, but at least I feel good in that I was aware of it because I was aware mm. of the distractions and being able to come back to the breath, you know? Yeah. But, but it was definitely uh, present there. Yeah. 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 And thank you for mentioning that. You know, sometimes or, or often our doubt is, is related to specific causes and conditions that are mm -hmm. happening around us, right? Or any of these hindrances. It's really hot, you know, agitation or sloth and torpor um, make a lot of sense. You know, I think especially for folks on longer retreat, there's a really interesting um decision point around when do you just go to sleep if you're like trying to practice all day and trying to practice and you're just falling asleep and mm -hmm. but you do reach a point where you have enough sleep and you realize oh this is just a hindrance like this isn't just me being tired this is me kind of not able to focus or mm -hmm. wanting to avoid it's almost its own form of distraction hmm. so there's a real difference between being hot and having exerted a lot and then the that other kind of layer or aspect so yeah although it kind of makes me think about uh, the buddha and the middle way and like what you said when he was depriving himself and he said no no this is not it so yeah. i guess being aware and listening to our body as well but not uh, but not being i guess lazy or just trying to you know justify something without real meaning or whatever so yeah yeah i mean i think you know trying to eliminate the hindrances of the mind through mortification of the body right or even through we could imagine the otherwise like everything your body could ever want in the most beautiful conditions like let's give everything possible to have this kind of delicious time it still is not going to get to those hindrances right um because we can be in the most beautiful setting in the world and feel miserable if we have one of those hindrances hanging out with us so yeah thank, thank you claudia you. thank you yeah. i see one more hand up there hello unmute hello it's isabella here um so thank you claudia for bringing that up because i was reflecting that a lot of my practice is devotional practice mm. and I do contemplate a lot of like on the grace of the guru and having faith on that and I I noticed that doubt is like that sneaking thing that it's always there that it's the opposite of faith and yes. I real I realized that if I truly believed what I think I believe I would be 100% confident that I have no problems because I have the protection of my guru no right. obstacles will never and and also in even in uh, the concept of enlightenment I think if we had zero doubt we would mm. be enlightened immediately so <laughs> it, it almost makes me think that that's the big obstacle and I I don't know I just thought about that. 
Yeah, thank you, Isabella. Yeah, beautifully stated. And if folks don't know, maybe much like devotional practices are um, often one in which we kind of call in or imagine these um, beings who have qualities that we so admire and we imagine them outside of ourselves so then we can invite them within us right it's really beautiful and but there is and or can be you know like am i just imagining this is this really happening and i could really see how doubt could arise there and i think you you know i I wanted to talk about this a little bit is in some of the traditional teachings the antidote to doubt is faith checking out of everyone's facial expression. Faith doesn't have like the best uh, reputation, I would say, in our modern culture. It's like, oh, really? Okay, just believe, right? And and they make a distinction about how faith is not belief. And to me, it does sound a little bit like this devotion. Um, and I think devotion is is really misunderstood. Devotion, often we think of your kind of surrendering your capacity to think for yourself and just you know, putting all of your care and aspirations to some other person or being. But the devotion, you know, I I find it's kind of this, it can be this natural way of surrendering the need to know. It's really just this devotion, you know, honestly, it can be towards towards life as your teacher, life as your guru. And again, it sounds like one of those like Buddhist sayings that can be really annoying. Like, yeah, life is my teacher. I get it. Everything is a gift. But, um, but really, there's this sense of um, devotion with like whatever is being um whatever is coming up in our life and also the devotion for the kind of um, the reprieve, like some of these feelings like doubt are so painful and then they dissipate and there's such a relief, right? And it gives us a little bit of that like hope or that sense that things are as they should be. These things come and go. I, I think the sense of doubt, especially, you know, as Isabella was saying, it can shake our entire sense of who we are and what we're doing. That's why it can be so painful. And then it's gone, right? It comes and goes. It doesn't necessarily stick around. And the opposite, this idea of like faith or kind of devotion, and faith and devotion are different, but to me, they have a similar resonance where the faith is something, it's like our ability to have a home ground that isn't only like our egoic self-structure. I actually think a lot of our doubt arises because we are often thinking just of ourselves and that individualistic approach, like, am I good enough? Am I doing it right? Am I gonna be successful like that person is successful? Am I as happy as that person? I'm not sure. You know, that sense of doubt that comes from just us. And whether or not you have a um, like a mystical or philosophical point of view, we can all agree upon the fact that there's more than we know and understand in this world, right? Like a little bit. <laughs> and that there is, you know, something greater that we don't understand. Is it a creator? Is it, you know, um, Gaia? I certainly don't know. I haven't seen um, evidence one way or the other of what is kind of bigger than me. But that sense, and it really can happen in the natural world, it can happen in many sorts of altered states. And with our meditation practice, a feeling like there is something so much bigger than my limited view of me and these identities that I wear every day in order to perform who I am and what I'm doing. And that from that place, I don't know how much doubt gets in there. And it's, it's not, I, I wish um, when Isabella was saying, you know, when we, if we live free of doubt, we might as well be enlightened, or maybe we would be enlightened. If we can really dwell in that place that is not so confined by this, in some ways like transactional relationship with the world, just very, um, and very appealing, but you can't like force faith, right? You can't force a sense of, you know, devotion to the world or bless you. Um, that really has to come through, um, I'd say a sense of kind of trust in what reality actually is and isn't. 
And so one, one of the other um, kind of antidotes or ways to work with doubt is to really see clearly what is reality. This is, of course, across the board in Buddhist teachings, right? And so much of our doubt is coming up from this delusion. I had a really awesome doubt experience on, when was it? Monday night. Woke up in the middle of the night and just really had this strong sense like, oh, I'm doing it wrong. There was not even really an it. Just like, I'm definitely doing it wrong. And probably other people have it figured out, but I don't. Anyone ever get that? And it's like amazing, especially it's like so unfair. It like hijacks you in the middle of the night because you're like defenseless, right? Tired, try not to like wake up your partner or whatever. And you're like, fuck. And um, and it was so interesting because like, luckily I had like a moment and really did like touch my heart. And it wasn't like, actually you're good. No, actually you're you're great. It was just, this probably isn't totally true. You know, and this is actually probably going to pass. And that, like that clear seeing of reality that all these mental states, you know, as, as you described so beautifully, like seeing that it just comes up as a contrivance and it passes. And then, you know, really being able to see the impermanence of everything. So whatever this it is that I'm not doing right, you know, it's always changing. And whoever else I think is doing it right, it's changing for them too. So a lot of our doubt does come out of a fundamental not clearly seeing this world of impermanence and always changing. And just also that it's uh, everything is so connected too. And I did find for me, I felt like part of that, part of that feeling of doubt was um, I hadn't had as much time to practice over the days prior you know, and I definitely was more in the material world of like, oh, I got to get things done and preparing for the week. And it just felt like I had a little bit lost what I'm really here to focus on, which is, you know, hopefully waking up in this lifetime with you all. And it is like my home ground there. There's so much potential and so much more spaciousness, still doubt, but home ground and like, are you doing it right? You know, compared to conventional reality. Oof. It's really tight. So, yeah. Yes. I mean, this is both a comment. It only goes to those guys. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, both a, a comment and a question, but sort of the relationship between doubt and what you were talking about, about seeing things clearly. And I guess when I heard doubt listed in the hindrance column, um, something about that did not feel quite right. Mm. And I, th I think why it didn't quite, not wrong, but not quite right, is that, for instance, there can be situations where we're in a relationship and <laughs> you begin to see things clearly. Yeah. And you begin to doubt whether this is a healthy, good relationship or yeah. this is a person you should trust with your heart. And that's a very good type of yes. doubt. And that's actually a doubt related to seeing clearly, yep. not as you were describing, you know, in uh, antithetical to seeing clearly. So I guess I'm just, I, I don't have any particular observation other than it seems like just taking the entire category of doubting, which I guess maybe I hear is questioning. Yeah. And moving it into the hindrance column. Yeah. Doesn't actually even feel consistent with a lot of Buddhist practice, which is about questioning and doubting some of your assumptions so that you can see clearly yes and that's like that's the good doubt so i'm just trying to separate out like the constructive helpful type of yeah doubting and inquiry which i don't think is yeah is the type of doubt we're talking i'm, I'm, just, no, trying to, I, I'm just trying to unpack that a little i'm so glad you bring it up and that is absolutely actually talked about in these um, translations of the buddhist texts and saying of course we want some doubt and that you know in relationship though there can be delusion sometimes in relationships too um but definitely this um you know, this, I think there's the reactive doubt and the skeptical doubt or some of the variations they talk about. And definitely like sometimes the doubt really matters. Like, is this really wholesome? 
is this supporting me? But the doubt where it's, you know, so much um, kind of locked in a single view of ourselves, and especially the doubt that really undermines our, you know, spiritual connection, which I think is like a big part of the hindrances, the doubt underneath the teachings and our, and not that we shouldn't doubt, like, um, is this the right fit for me? Because, you know, there, there's a lot of forms of spiritual practice. And so we should find the ones that work for us. So there's, there's a, it's interesting because doubt is definitely more of like a mental kind of practice. Um, but it doesn't seem as though it's kind of new to our time. Right. You look at as much as there is of any kind of written, I think Descartes writes about doubt. Um, obviously, the Buddha is thinking about doubt. What an interesting and common way for us to be skeptical and considering. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I saw a hand back there and then me. OK, yeah. yeah. Do you feel satisfied? Yeah. OK, good. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Okay. I'll pass on you. Uh, I, first of all, thank you for sharing your personal story um, on that. What I keep going back to, and maybe it's a detachment from wanting to go as deep into the doubt, um, but it actually, the question comes from something you had just said around doubt. And I'm curious to know if doubt resides so deeply in us Americans versus abroad. And I know you've spent a lot of time abroad and I'm sure there are other people who've studied abroad as well, but because we Americans are born into this world, that is, it's about self-orientation as mm. to ego. That's how we come out. That's how, that's how it's modeled for us yeah. is it's about me, my experience, how I believe, how I see, how other people experience me, my performance. Mm. Think about this as Americans, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm so curious to know how other cultures, Nigeria, uh, that's not cultures, other places, yeah. um, and all these other incredible countries where babies are born and they're in community mm -hmm. and their orientation is the system and not self. Yeah. So I'm, I guess it's, I don't know if it's rhetorical or if you have an answer for it, but yeah. So curious to know if, if other cultures suffer far less than we do. Yeah. It's, I think, I think it's very interesting question. And um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to me that of course doubt is prevalent in the time of the Buddha. And that was quite a long time ago, quite a different culture. And we do see doubt written about in so many different times that I, you know, I'm my area of um, such passion and interest is in emotions, which we know are universal for all time everywhere. Is, but doubt isn't exactly an emotion. It's more of a mental state. But my guess is kind of like emotions. It has served a function evolutionarily for us. And so it is represented. And of course, in this country, there's so many different experiences and cultures and how people are um, brought into the world and existing with one another. But I do think we're like uniquely messed up. <laughs> so I, I don't want to like totally let that one go. Um, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's doubt. But I think what you describe, you know, is so true of like, very often, many people in this country do feel that they they don't belong, right, to anyone, you know, and they have to prove themselves. They have to earn their belonging. And that's not true everywhere, you know. There's a beautiful author, meditation teacher, Sebene Selassie, some people may know, and she has a book, You Belong, highly recommend, really beautiful. So thank you. Um, so this is more of a comment, great, or like just conversation starter, yeah. um, on faith and devotion mm. and reality. So I've been learning a lot about like Buddhist, uh, Tibetan Buddhism and their concept of emptiness, right? Like everything is empty of its nature, right? Like the meaning comes from our minds to things and not from the outside to our minds. And it's, you know, everything that we practice all the times, right? Like, yeah what you were saying about like um we can reproduce these feelings because we're thinking about them right mm. so that's like the whole concept right like everything comes from our minds and so the whole thing about like devotion and, and faith on reality like 
we create our own reality. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's our own individual reality of what we perceive. And there's like a shared reality of what we all perceive. And there's like quantum reality of like just millions of way of (laughs) existing. Yeah. Right. Of reality Mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. Um, and like understanding that power of the mind Mm. is so crazy because like, then you're like, Oh my God, like I can feel and make, you know, whatever I want essentially when I, when you truly understand that, which is super hard. Um, and so like the devotion, I feel like it's, it's like devoting to that, right? Like being devoted to having the faith that you have that power Mm. in the mind. Yeah devotion to like the practice because yeah. like there's no there's no other way to like actually get there it's like enlightenment it's like years of just practicing yeah understanding that right yeah um mm. so like the way i see it is that way like not necessarily faith on um and of course like faith spiritual beings and, and all of that for sure for sure like exists um but I also find it like more powerful to think in that way, like devotion to the practice and devotion to that understanding. Yeah. So beautiful. I really appreciate you sharing that. And, you know, I think when you were describing it, what I heard really is like reverence, you know, just this like, wow. And I often have this joke that um, like gratitude is a gateway drug for devotion, you know, just this like, small like oh I appreciate that and I appreciate and well I appreciate oh god (laughs) I'm in you know like you start it starts to get that level of really seeing just the beautiful complexity and I do think you know not in a self-centered way of devotion to our own mind but like to consciousness as being um just perfect right just perfect um, even with everything being so messed up. And that's why, it, you know, it's so beautiful. Um, this idea in Tibetan Buddhism of, of the pure land or this place where, you know, everything is truly in its most beautiful and um, available state to us. It's like all the beings are enlightened and we are enlightened. And this idea that the pure land is actually already here. Right. And how do we and the hindrances is like, how do we keep cleaning up um, our own minds and doing the kind of someone said today, mental housekeeping um, so that we can we can be available for that, which is already here. Mace, did you have a comment? I'm only going to offer. Um, <clears throat> OK, a distinction with discernment and doubt. Oh, beautiful. And then I think I've heard that doubt is the near enemy of wise discernment. Mm. I thought was awesome. Yeah. So Mace is sharing that um, she's heard that doubt is like the near enemy of wise discernment <clears throat> and discernment in, in Buddhism is really this. Um, it is that kind of inquiry and, and a bit more to what you were saying is like usually in essence, what is wholesome and unwholesome. Right. And being able to discern that um, it's also the way sometimes that Buddhists let them off the hook themselves off the hook for being judgmental. <laughs> right it's like that wasn't judging i was discerning <laughs> there's a fine line right um but it is it's really good to like is this wholesome is this unwholesome and i'd say the the difference you know of the judgment and the discernment is yeah like how how much are we kind of holding on to it um I wanted to share, I, I just love these, that there are a couple beautiful metaphors for the hindrances. No problem. Um, <clears throat> so one of the um, one of the ways that the hindrances are described is as though they were each like something that would happen with water. So if you mix like a dye, like an indigo dye with water and you really can't see or know anything, that is like sensual desire. So like we're just colored by it. We just can't see outside of it. And and especially in the original teaching of it, it said um, for all the hindrances, not only are we unable to know what is of benefit to us, we're completely unable to know what is of benefit for others when we're under this. And then for ill will, it's like water that's boiling over. 
definitely feels that way, right? And again, we're so possessed by this feeling of ill will that we can't see what's wholesome for ourselves and benefit for ourselves and others. And that um, sloth and torpor are like slimy water with algae in it. <laughs> but it's like, I love the viscerality and bringing in these natural metaphors. And then um, restlessness and worry is like water that's disturbed on the surface by wind. So if you've been to the beach at all in like three months, that's all we got. No, sir. Um, so water disturbed by wind. And then the fifth, doubt. My God. It's like muddy, murky water that's in the dark in a like unseen place. <laughs> I just, I, I think that that's um, like kind of beautiful. In the dark, like in an unseen place. Like I imagine it's like, like, like a sewer. Yeah. I don't know if that's, yeah, that's doubt. And then <clears throat> One other metaphor about what it's like to be free from the hindrances is like being freed from debt, illness, prison, slavery, and being lost in the wilderness. Wow. And so each, so then, you know, the debt, the debt is the desire. Uh, the illness is the ill will. Being in prison is like being um, kind of pulled down by drowsiness and torpor being enslaved is being enslaved to restlessness and worry and being in doubt is like being in a wild unfriendly wilderness so those are the um those are the beautiful kind of natural descriptions and for each of these there's like a pretty simple antidote that i'm going to say very quickly um for desire it really um when we have that desire we've done this here before and talked about it it's really meditating on anything that we think we desire it's definitely changing and decaying mm -hmm. and to get really clear on that like when the buddha has all his monks go watch the body of a beautiful woman decay on the funeral in the charnel grounds to recognize that beauty it's temporary and our ill will, loving kindness. I think that's always our antidote. Um, and for sloth and torpor, it's, yeah, being attendant to your needs for rest, right? And, um, <clears throat> and then with uh, restlessness, how do we cultivate calm mind? Which I just, I love that term. It's something His Holiness the Dalai Lama <clears throat> uses a lot, like, that could be simple practice of focused attention on the breath, but really finding a way to have that ground, that calm mind. And then for doubt, it is, you know, the antidote is, is classically faith. So how do we find our confidence? How do we find that true refuge? So let's take a moment, dedicate the merit here together. <laughs> So taking our gaze inward once again and reconnecting to the body and the breath. And we take this moment symbolically to offer up any benefit that we might have been generating through our time here together. In the sense that our work here is truly in service to all beings. And so if it's comfortable putting hands together at the heart and considering offering up this practice, this time, and for the aspiration that all beings could know peace and ease, all beings could be free from their hindrances, all beings could know love and belonging. Thank you all so much. Really wonderful to be together. Um, so we are an entirely volunteer run center and we exist off generosity. So we could really use your financial support in any way possible. Monthly donations are great or one time only every form of payment available. 
Also, the center is run by volunteers, and we always are looking for more volunteers, which is a great way to get to know folks and support the community here. So you could talk to Mace or Cage about that. Um, I have almost always forgotten, but I am doing a retreat in October with Ryan, and I have flyers. I still have to cut them in half, but uh, it's at Big Bear Meditation Center uh, outside LA. It's a five-day retreat on emotional balance. It'd be really awesome if any of you want to come. And we have other announcements. You. Yeah. Hi, friends. I'm Mace. 